Hello and welcome to this very special CNBC News Debate from the World Economic Forum in the Dead Sea. We're going to be talking geopolitics and the implications for the MENA region. I want to kick off by introducing our distinguished panelists, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, Salah al-Mutlaq, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Jordan, Nasser Juda, His Excellency, who needs no introduction, Amr Musa, as well as the UN Special Envoy to Cyprus and Managing Director here at the World Economic Forum, Espen Ida. Welcome, gentlemen. Now, this region is going through something of a watershed moment. You have uh, a resurgent Iran and a defiant Saudi Arabia. And the question we're attempting to answer today is how those current realignments are going to shape the future of MENA. You have to look at the future role of Iran, um, especially President Obama now saying that the Gulf region is of vital interest um, to the United States. So what is the US uh, doctrine going to really mean on the ground? And Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, I'd like to start with you. Um, What's the future role of Iran in the region, um, given their role in supporting uh, Iraq in the fight against the Islamic State, and also in the fact that they're in basically a de facto alliance there with the U.S.? يعني واضح إنه الحدود بيننا وبين إيران تتجاوز ألف ومئتين كيلومتر طول، وبالتالي هذان البلدان يجب أن يتعايشا سوية. ولا يمكن لهذا الشد الموجود حاليا واللي كان سابقا أن يبقى مستمر وإن استمر فستنعكس هذه الأمور سلبا على كلا البلدين إيران والعراق طبعا إيران بسبب ما حصل من احتلال العراق بعد 2003 استفادت من هذا الظرف وأصبح لها وجود قوي جدا ووجود كبير في داخل العراق وجود اقتصادي وجود سياسي وجود حتى على المستوى الديني يؤثر في المجتمع العراقي اليوم احنا في معركة وهذه المعركة تحتاج الى ان كل الدول المنطقة تجتمع سوية لمواجهتها لانها معركة ليست سهلة اليوم نحن نقاتل عدو من نوع خاص عدو تمكن من غزو أكثر من دولة وبالتالي محاربة هذا العدو لا تقتصر على دولة معينة بذاتها وإنما يجب أن يتعاون المجتمع الدولي بشكل عام وخصوصا دول الإقليم لمكافحة هذا العدو نريد, نريد للجارة إيران أن تتعاون مع العراق في مقاتلة داعش ولكننا نتمنى أن يكون دور إيران أيضا إيجابي فيما بعد داعش داعش ستنتهي في العراق سونر أو ليتر لكن ما بعد داعش قد يكون موضوع خطير جدا ولذلك عندما جاء موضوع الحشد الشعبي واللي قسم عنده كان مدعوم من قبل الجارة إيران نقول نريد لهذا الحشد أن يساهم في هذه المعركة ولكن لا نريد لهذا الحشد أن يتحول إلى جيش موازي للجيش العراقي أو ربما أقوى من الجيش العراقي وبالتالي يكون لدينا جيشان وهذا أمر غير صحيح نريد جيش واحد للعراق اسمه الجيش العراقي المقاتل عن كل العراقيين ولا نريد حشد شعبي يتحول إلى جيش الحشد الشعبي مرحب بأن يقاتل مع أبناء العشائر ولكن لا أن يتحول إلى ميليشيا أو قوة عسكرية في داخل العراق قد تخلق إشكالات لاحقا تؤثر على النسيج الاجتماعي تؤثر على وحدة البلد تؤثر على نسيج البلد بحيث لا يمكن أن نجد بلد موحد وإنما بلد مقسم أقول أن مقاتل الداعش الجانب العسكري بها مهم والدور الإيراني ممكن أن يساعد وحقيقة أن أول مساعدات أو خلينا نقول أول أسلحة إن كانت مساعدات أو لقاء ثمن دخلت إلى العراق جاءت من إيران وتأخرت الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية حتى في تسليح العراقيين جاءت من إيران وسلحت الحشد الشعبي هذا هذا التسليح لوحدة غير كافي لأن المعركة مع داعش لا يمكن أن تحسب على أنها معركة عسكرية فقط وإنما معركة فيها الجانب السياسي مهم وإيجاد 
حل سياسي للإشكالات السياسية الموجودة في البلد قضية مهمة جدا وإيران عليها أن تلعب دور في هذا الموضوع دور إيجابي لأن لها تأثير على كثير من الكتل السياسية الموجودة اليوم في العراق وبدون وعندما تلعب إيران الدور السلبي فسينعكس هذا الموضوع سلبا على العراق وسلبا على إيران لاحقا فمطالبون اليوم بحل سياسي يوازي الحل العسكري يسيران بشكل متوازي حتى يشعر المواطن أنه لديه مستقبل في هذا البلد ولديه أمن وبالتالي يلتحق لمقاتل الداعش يلتحق مع الآخرين لمقاتل الداعش أما إذا وجد المواطن أن لا مستقبل له في هذا البلد بسبب الظلم والتهميش والإقصاء ووجود عملية سياسية يشعر فيها أنه مقصي عنها فبالتالي لا نتوقع منه أن يلتحق وتكون هناك كتلة بشرية قوية تقاتل داعش سوية. President Obama has been quoted as saying essentially that um, we're not losing the fight against the Islamic State. What's your take on that? And in terms of your response to those who worry about more weapons coming into Iraq, not just these rockets that President Obama has promised Iraq, but also new weapons coming in from Russia as well. What about the worry that those weapons are going to end up in the hands of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and in the hands of ISIS? يعني احنا بالنتيجة يجب أن نسلح ويجب أن تكون الأسلحة نوعية تتميز في حداثتها وفي نوعيتها عن الأسلحة الموجودة عن الداعش أو على الأقل تكون موازية للأسلحة الموجودة عن الداعش اليوم الأسلحة الموجودة عن الداعش هي أقوى أفضل من الأسلحة الموجودة عند الجيش العراقي وعند حتى الحشد الشعبي وبالتالي لا يجوز أن تبقى الأسلحة بهذا المستوى داعش اليوم تدخل إلى المناطق عن طريق مدرعات مفخخة ولا يستطيع الجندي العراقي أن يفجرها عندما تتوجه باتجاهها وبالتالي تنفجر ثم تأتي الأخرى وتنفجر وهذه قوة الحقيقة من الصعب صدها بهذا الطريقة وبالتالي محتاجين إلى سلاح الذي يفجر هذه الآليات قبل وصولها السيد أوباما يقول We are not losing ربما أنه لا يخسر ولكننا نحن العراقيون نخسر نخسر أرواح نخسر شهداء يوميا يذهبوا من عندنا في معركة الأنبار وحدها الأخيرة في الهجوم على الأنبار خسرنا قريب الألف شهيد من الأبطال الذين كانوا يقاتلوا لمدة سنة ونصف وفقدوا حياتهم لأنهم لم يحصلوا على العتاد اللازم لمقاومة داعش وبالتالي يجب أن تكون هناك استراتيجية عسكرية جديدة للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وللتحالف الدولي تختلف عن الاستراتيجية السابقة الضربات التي توجه اليوم من قبل الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ومن قبل التحالف الدولي بشكل عام غير كافية وواضح أن هناك أهداف قالت الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أنها خط أحمر وبقت خطا أحمر لم يستطع داعش أن يصلها لأن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية قادرة على أن توقف داعش من الوصول إلى هذه الخطوط ولكنها وصلت إلى مناطق أخرى لم تحدد الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أنها ضمن الخط الأحمر العراق كله والمنطقة يجب أن تكون خط أحمر ضد داعش خط أحمر لا يستطيع داعش أن يصلها هذه هي استراتيجية جديدة التي يجب على الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والتحالف الدولي أن ينتهجوها في المنطقة لا أن يوجهوا ضربات هنا وهناك وهي غير فعالة أمام التقدم الذي يحصل من قبل داعش So you're looking for a new strategy from the United States. I want to bring in uh, Jordan's Foreign Minister, Nasser Judah. Your Excellency, I want to ask you, I mean, given the fact that Jordan is pretty much in the middle of all of this happening with Syria and Iraq, or buffeted from all sides, what's your take on this? Is the U.S. doing the right thing? Is the international community doing enough? Um, well, it, it's not just about um, uh, one country doing the right thing um, uh, or not. It's about a collective um, uh, effort that needs to be um, uh, conducted in concert uh, between um, uh, everyone. Because this but is not a lot of people are very unhappy with the United States right now. Well, 
um, uh, that's up to a lot of people. But I'm just um, um, trying to say that this is uh, an issue that relates not just to regional security or individual country um, security. Uh, this uh, relates to uh, global security. This war against um, terrorism and uh, extremist ideology uh, does not uh, present a, a threat to one individual country, whether in this region uh, or beyond. I keep uh, saying that what we saw in the last um, uh, few um, uh, months, um, take um, Sydney, Australia, Australia for exa example, take um, uh, Paris um, uh, for another example, Ottawa, Canada, Copenhagen, um, not to mention what's happening in the, in, in the region. This is a global fight. Uh, His Majesty King Abdullah II has called it um, um, a third world war by other means. And what that means um, is that when you have 70 or 80 nationalities fighting alongside Daesh, um, and 60 or 70 countries fighting Daesh, um, ISIS, uh, then it's none other than um, a third world war. But you can't look at what's happening uh, today in the present without looking at the past and learning from the, from the past. I mean, this region, and since the, 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 the title of the session is uh, the geostrategic um, uh, outlook and how the realignments are, uh, are taking place, you can't, you can't do that uh, divorced from the fact that this region for the first time is perhaps taking things um, into uh, its own uh, hands, given the challenges uh, that we're facing. Jordan is in the forefront of the fight against terrorism and, uh, and extremism because the long-term war is the ideological war. It's not the military war, which is as a result of the clear and present danger. It's not the security, um, whether it's regional security or global security, which has to be tackled because it's also a challenge. It's the ideological um, war at different uh, levels. Why do I say that um, uh, this is the first time that the region is taking things into its own hand? Take um, the four milestones, if you want, in the last uh, 100 uh, years. Post-World um, uh, War I, uh, this region, the Arab uh, region, shifted from being under um, Ottoman rule uh, to being under British and French um, uh, colonialism or mandates uh, following the collapse of the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. Come 1945 and the end of the Second uh, uh, World War, you see the creation of Israel and uh, at the beginning of the plight of the Palestinian uh, people and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the wider Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. And also, uh, in conjunction with that, you have the, the Cold War and the polarization of the, uh, of the, of the region. Come 2003, uh, you have the war in, uh, in Iraq and uh, the dismantling of the state structure in Iraq, which led to the ethnic and sectarian uh, violence, which spread um, beyond the borders of, uh, of Iraq. And then you have Arab Spring, which I think dealt the final blow. Um, and, and you have ethnic and sectarian um, uh, strife across um, uh, our uh, region. And you have uh, extremism and extremist ideology and uh, terrorist organizations spreading not just within the region, but beyond the regions. Is Jordan worried then about the growing influence of Iran in Iraq? Is that a problem for Jordan? Jordan's worried about many things, and Jordan's been um, uh, warning um, for the last uh, um, a few years. Um, if you remember um, uh, the beginning of the Syrian uh, crisis, and we're entering the fifth year of that now, right from the beginning we were saying this is not just another uh, you know, domino um, effect type of uh, event taking place in the context of Arab Spring. We were saying that this is going to be a long, protracted uh, civil war that's going to change uh, from um, a rebellion uh, to a political civil war, to a civil war of an ethnic and sectarian na nature, uh, to a fertile ground for the spread and the rise and spread of uh, extremism. And this is exactly what, uh, what happened. That is going to go beyond the borders of Syria. So we are worried, but we're doing something about it. When I spoke with His Majesty King Abdullah earlier this week, we discussed many things, including the rise of the Islamic State and the impact that that's having on Jordan. Obviously, it's impacting trade routes. It's also impacting um, this long-awaited Iraq uh, and uh, pipeline to Aqaba. Um, give me a sense, then, of how Jordan specifically is tackling this challenge. Well, pipelines um, in today's uh, um, global geopolitics uh, can be either, um, uh, either pipelines uh, as a tool of warfare uh, or as a tool of diplomacy or for some like Jordan a lifeline. Uh, so um, when you're talking about a country like Jordan that imports 96, 97 percent of its energy and in spite of our extremely ambitious energy policy for the next uh, uh, 20 years, uh, a pipeline is extremely uh, uh, important to sustain um, our ambitious plans. So we're it doesn't mean that we're just looking at that. We're looking at alternatives as well. It's a big problem, though, because, of course, the problem with pipelines is that they can be blown up. And, of course, the pipeline that we're talking about would have to go through the Anbar province, which is yes. quite, quite messy at the moment. Um, give me a sense, then, in terms of just not only Jordan's interest 
in the safety and security of Iraq, um, but also the wider regional interest in that, because it's, it's impacting trade everywhere. And we, what we're talking about really is the need for international trade, no? Well, historically and traditionally, Iraq is Jordan's biggest uh, trading partner and vice versa. So the security and stability and the prosperity of uh, Iraq is very much at the heart of Jordan's national interest. Um, we are seeing um, many concrete steps uh, on the right track, um, in the right uh, direction uh, taking place. But we can't um, um, undermine the effects and, uh, and the real danger that uh, the fight against terrorism and extremism and the interference in um, Iraq's uh, affairs. Uh, these are all factors that have to be looked at and have to be looked at extremely eff effectively, dealt with extremely effectively. I want to bring in Amr Musa. You're a man with a vast experience um, as Secretary General of the Arab League and also in Egypt trying to bring investment to your own country and open up um, uh, for energy reform, which is something that, that Egypt desperately needs to do. How does a resurgent Iran and this sort of defiant Sunni alliance in the Gulf play in the neighborhood? Well, let me start by referring to the prevailing anarchy in the region. The uh, chaos, the uh, confrontations, the uh, terrorist uh, uh, actions, terrorist organizations, and so on. So, uh, this situation has not come by just uh, by chance. Uh, there are a lot of policies exercised by our own governments, several of them. I believe that the bad governance has led to part of what we see today in the region. In so far as Daesh is concerned, and Daesh is but a demonstration, a result of wrong policies, had there been no wrong policies, violent policies, bloody policies by the previous government in Iraq, perhaps Daesh wouldn't have that chance of uh, uh, being created and a very powerful uh, organization moving in a vast area between uh, Iraq and Syria, and also sending elements to North Africa and Libya. So this is something new. We were discussing that uh, this afternoon and yesterday, the whole of yesterday. A question mark about Daesh, mm. a major question mark. We were told by some experts yesterday that the best salaries young people would get is if they join Daesh. Others have said that not only so, when a young man joins Daesh, he's assured of that there will be some body or some organization that will find a bride for him, will get him married, get them married, perhaps also buy an apartment in some Arab capitals, and give him a lot of money. From where does this organization get all this money? Today we were told also that uh, the camions, the cars, the pickups, the weapons, the, they're all new. And that Daesh is in full control, not only of vast areas, but of uh, sources of money, of income. And somebody also reminded us that those elements, hundreds of troops or of members of Daesh that were transferred, transported from northern Iraq and Syria to Libya. Who paid for all that? With their uh, camions, with their pickups, with their uh, weapons and so on. This raises a question. Is this indeed a non-state actor? as Espen would tell us, and because he started by raising that issue yesterday. All it is a proxy war. That powerful uh, uh, states are uh, trying to weaken others <clears throat> through or by using such an organization, financing them, paying them, and let them change the, 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 the landscape. Asman, you want to weigh in on That's that? That's number one. Number 
when what are we going to do or what would Iraqis for example expect to uh, to reach once Daesh is defeated and this is a question you have raised uh, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister so the situation prevailing the status quo ante is it going to be the same after that the same discrimination the same bloody confrontation between between so on or order will uh, uh, have established it of part of preparing for that new order. Three, are we witnessing new operation of drawing a new map of the Middle East along the same lines but different tools like Sykes Pico of 1914 when two diplomats sat down and mm -hmm. drew a map. This time so Baghdadi and I don't know who, etc., who are so, moving and trying to impose a certain, uh, a new map. Your Excellency, then which one is it? Is it all of the above? It is all the above in one way, but it, more than this above is what are we going to do later on? I believe that Daesh is a uh, passing phenomenon, violent one, but it will come and go. It cannot... Uh, 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 stay and, and, and rule the Middle East. It is an impossible proposition. But what are we going to do? I believe that what we in the Middle East need a new regional order. We need a new security order. And we talk about new regional order, we have to raise a question mark about the intentions of the emerging of the Iran, the new Iran emerging after the deal with the uh, the, the nuclear deal, and bringing back its own money. Your Excellency, what I'm are they going to do really with this? Really quickly, or I'm not going to get to our other guests, but I'm going to come right back to you. I, I'm ready to stop. <laughs> uh, Osman, I want to wait. But way those on are this. all elements, one after the other, that have to be uh, raised and discussed. The order in the regional order, the security order, the nuclear weapons in the region, and the uh, the, the, the the governance. How can we achieve good governance in order to avoid repeating the same thing within 10 years or 15 years again? Got it. Osman? <clears throat> I very much agree with Amr Musa on, on this last point. I think we have to understand that this crisis is in a deep, this region is in a deep crisis, which has several roots, and, but to simplify a little bit, and it's a simplification. Uh, one element is the collapse of all systems that we're not able to deliver. That creates a vacuum and people looking for new solutions. And for some young people, the only solution presented is the, is the false allure of Daesh or, or ISIS, which is not only a product of frustration, but also a quest for identity and meaning and purpose in a world that seems chaotic to a lot of people. So you have that part. But at the same time, it's perfectly correct in my view that there's also a strategic competition going on between key players who know what they're doing and who's fueling this and trying to exploit this chaos to advance positions, uh, literally and more uh, indirectly, in uh, the countries in question, in Syria and in Iraq and in Yemen, and, and eventually also in, in Libya and in African countries. Um, so, so there's a strategic competition in this region which resembles what we're seeing elsewhere. I mean, in, in, over Ukraine, Ukraine is not only about Ukraine. It's about Russia and the West. In East Asia, we also see strategic competition. So as, uh, as uh, Nasser Yuda said earlier today in a different debate here at the forum, uh, it, we can not only understand the region in its regional context, we understand the region in the general uh, geopolitical crisis of the world. At the same time, I also think that there are solutions to this. And I think that the solution has to be found in Arab societies, all the societies in the region, really dealing with change, accepting that change must come not the change that's proposed by ISIS and Daesh, of course, which is actually trying to go back to some very past ideas, but, uh, but a way to include economically and political people who are, have been longing for that for a long time. And it's up to governments, but it's also up to people and companies and others to deal with that. And secondly, uh, we need to understand that if we have strategic competition, we need a strategic compromise. We need to accept that key players, be it the uh, new Iran that may be emerging now with Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf states and, 
and other and, and Turkey and so on are actually at some stage have to understand that this crisis will not be solved in a single country on its own, nor will it be solved by the UN Security Council or the global level. It really needs a regional understanding. And that has to be promoted and fostered by everybody who believes in, in, in peace and cooperation. And where is the price of oil in all of this? Where does that weigh in, frankly? Because you have a situation where Saudi Arabia needs a certain oil price. You're going to have Iranian crude coming back onto the market if a deal is reached. What's, how does this all play yeah. out? One, exactly one year ago today, the, the price of Brent was $110.9. Uh, today, I think it's 61. So that's 40% lower. That's significant. It's significant in different directions. For some countries who are consumers, it's good news because the price of energy is low. For producers, it's obviously bad news uh, because the price is low and there's less margins, and that can influence investment decisions. The geopolitical crisis, when you add that to that, will lead some actors and companies to think, well, if we have a high oil price, I will accept a certain risk. But if the oil price is low, I will be more careful about risk, and that can divert uh, uh, investments in different directions. And another important point to recognize is that once upon a time, the main direction of flow from Middle East and oil was to the, the US. Today it's to China. So, so the, the flow that used to go west are now going east, and that means that new great powers will, whether they like it or not, will start becoming more interested in what's happening in this region. And I think many people in the region are now wondering, what is, the, is there a continued American uh, interest at the level we used to? Um, maybe the answer is yes, but it's a fair question to ask. Nasser Judah, I want to make, bring you in here because you guys have just signed some uh, deals with the Chinese, some massive deals. We talked to those uh, with His Majesty. You're also signing with the Russians on some nuclear power plants as well. But you're an energy poor country. Where does that leave you guys and others like you in the region? Well, like I said before, um, uh, we have an ambitious energy um, uh, program when it comes to renewable and alternative um, uh, energy. We can't com continue being hostage uh, to um, uh, the fact that um, uh, we are um, a 96-97% importer of, uh, of energy and um, our biggest uh, burden financially every year is our energy bill uh, and the time has come for us to think creatively and we are doing that and we're doing something, uh, something about it. But I just want to go back, if I may, uh, to um, uh, a couple of the points um, uh, that were mentioned um, uh, before by my distinguished colleagues. Um, Amr Musa mentioned Sykes-Pico um, and next year, 2016, we will uh, mark 100 years of Sykes-Pico. Um, and some people may call the turbulent events of this region uh, nowadays as the revenge of demography um, against uh, geography and the geopolitics of uh, 100 uh, years ago. Be that as it may, uh, the end result is the fact that uh, we're seeing chaos and, um, and failed states and the weakening of the, uh, the centrality of the, the state system and the introduction of non-state players. Um, if you look at the period between um, 1914, even with the influence of um, global powers uh, in this region, but from 1914 up until 2003, uh, there were no non-state players to speak of um, uh, in, in this region. But th since 2003, and particularly in the last four or five years, we have uh, non-state uh, players really taking the lead. So this takes us back to um, what I was saying earlier, which is the fact that the um, states in the region are taking um, uh, the lead back um, so that they can address the challenges that they face. And for us in, um, uh, in Jordan, like I said, with uh, a forward-looking um, uh, visionary uh, leadership and with all the constraints, um, political or otherwise, that we are facing in, uh, uh, in this region, we're doing something about it and we are a success um, uh, model. Uh, but we don't live in a cocoon. Uh, we have to keep um, uh, our eye on, uh, on the region. Somebody who was trying to be extremely complimentary, they told me Jordan is like a, a, gar a beautiful garden in the middle of a bushfire. Well, this is true, um, uh, but uh, we, we have to do um, everything um, in our power uh, in conjunction and collaboration with our uh, regional and um, international uh, uh, allies uh, to put out this bushfire, um, regardless of the symptoms of it. One of the direct results of what we're now calling um, the Obama Doctrine um, is this uh, defiant Saudi Arabia with a very interesting policy in Yemen, um, the results of which we have yet to really see or probably understand. Um, Aswan, give me your sense on that, what kind of progress they're making there and how that is going to have a knock-on effect throughout the region. I think Yemen is, is but one of the many examples of this strategic competition between 
you know, on the one hand, uh, Saudi Arabia and some other Arab players and, and Iran, and it can be real and perceived, but, it's, but it's, Yemen is about much more than Yemen. And it's a part of this big game or big play that's going on uh, in this region. And, and why, so when we said Syria has to be solved in a regional context, I mean, Yemen can also be so, only be solved in a regional context as well, if the players want to, to solve it. I think it's incredibly important to follow closely what's happening with Iran and in Iran. I mean, what's happening with Iran, I mean, the, the relationship between uh, the P5 plus 1 and, and Iran in the nuclear talks and what that can lead to when it comes to realigning uh, relationship on a very grand scale. And secondly, what's happening in Iran as a consequence of that? What kind of power shift may that lead to inside? That's going to be uh, 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 one of the most important drivers of change in the region. Uh, we don't know exactly how, but it's very, very important for anybody interested in this region to follow that very closely. And it's quite exciting, quite interesting, and for some people quite frightening. Amr Musa. Well, I believe we have to be clear about this issue of Iran. We are not promoting animosity, and we should not promote animosity between Iran and the Arab world. Uh, but this puts a serious responsibility on our shoulders and on Iran's shoulders. Iran has to show that her ambitions, and all countries have ambitions, are not to to boost about controlling capitals and controlling countries, Arab countries, and so on. Something that should be eliminated from the jargon, from the talk, from policies. The Middle East, the Arab world, is going through a major and deep change operation. Call it revolutions, call it uh, eruption, call it as you call it, but it is a real operation of change in the Arab world. The Arab world is going to be a different Arab world in a few years. Don't go back to that 20th century and practices or even centuries before that. So who's going to hold a, that 20 Iran to century, account all the way, for this? Me? Who's going to hold Iran to account for this, frankly? Um, because the United States is pretty much um, checked out, as far as we can tell, at least for the foreseeable future. The so is it going to be Egypt? Is it going to be Iraq? Is it going to be Jordan? Who's going to hold Iran to account? Yes, indeed. And we have to sit and talk. We ourselves have to sit and talk. And so we it's a conversation. Should not, we should not believe or listen or wait for any promises. Promises of the like that we heard and we were hurt by such promises that were never honored. We're not going to listen to any more of that. But we have to sit and see what kind of future our region needs to be. And this needs the Arabs, needs Iran, needs Turkey, all of them under conditions of peace and peaceful relations and just legitimate aspirations. And this brings the Palestinian question, which was raised by uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, in order for Israel to be which able one? to participate <laughs> yourself, uh, Nasser. Uh, if, Iran, uh, if Israel wants to participate and be part of this region, they have to change their policy and address properly the Palestinian question and the Palestinian aspirations. Otherwise, I don't think any of us would sit at the same table with Israel if the Palestinian issue no, That's right. No, I just want to uh, comment on, um, uh, on Iran. Amr Musa will remember that four years ago, he and I and a few of our um, uh, Arab colleagues were actually talking about a dialogue with, uh, with Iran. And the need to have a dialogue with, with Iran on some of the uh, lingering um, issues, some of the tensions. But the general feeling was that um, uh, before we come to the table, um, we have to have a clear commitment uh, that, um, uh, and resolve that these issues um, uh, are, are to be resolved. Now, as far as the nuclear file is concerned, we in Jordan, four or five years ago, even when there was uh, talk of uh, an imminent uh, military strike against uh, Iran, we were out there saying that we are against this. Uh, we do not need uh, another eruption. We do not need uh, another uh, factor of instability in an already um, volatile uh, region, and that this file should be resolved diplomatically. And so uh, in the context of the P5 plus one discussions with Iran to resolve the nuclear file, um, I think there's general and universal agreement now that uh, this is uh, uh, not only accept acceptable, but encouraged. We are hoping, though, that this will be um, a gateway towards a wider discussion 
um, on uh, several uh, uh, issues in the uh, in the region. I mean, the deputy prime minister from uh, Iraq, my distinguished colleague, was saying earlier he kept referring to Iran as uh, the neighbor, Iran, and Iran is a neighbor to uh, to this region. But you can't have a, a neighbor with uh, ongoing. Um, uh, differences and ongoing uh, uh, problem uh, uh, areas. Uh, and like I said, if you go back in, uh, uh, in history, Iran and, uh, and Turkey between 1914 and, uh, and 1948 actually were not really involved in the Arab affairs of the Arab uh, uh, region. I think we only saw the involvement of, uh, uh, of Iran or the influence of Iran, in, of Iran post-1979 and the influence uh, of Turkey even more recent um, uh, than, uh, uh, than that. Uh, perhaps the only non-Arab uh, state actor in the uh, 50s and, uh, uh, and 60s and uh, 70s was Israel. Uh, so in order to have a regional discussion, I totally agree with Amr Moussa, a regional discussion that includes everybody, I think many of the differences have to be resolved and have to be removed off the table uh, in order to sit and talk about the regional uh, concerns and how this region can address other concerns beyond the region. I want to direct a question now to the deputy. Yeah. Uh, what I want to say is that at the end, we have to have a dialogue with our neighbor Iran in order to solve the problems between us and the Iranians. And since Iraq is so weak nowadays, we cannot expect that the dialogue will go on in a fair way when there is a weak partner and the other one is strong enough. Therefore, we have to have a dialogue between the region and Iran, actually, the Arabs and Iran. Mm -hmm. And that dialogue should continue until we, uh, we, we reach an end, not just uh, trying to cheat each other, no. What is happening now is that we know that with the exportation of the Islamic theory from Iran to the other countries, this will never lead to stability in the country. So this has to be ended in a way that it will not end to an interference in the other countries. Now, having militias in Iraq or in other countries which is being supported by the Iranian, it is unfair and you cannot build a good relation with a country while there is a support from one country to a militia and the other country. Economically, Iran will benefit from a strong relation with Iran and with the region. And the region also will, you know, uh, will, will see a stability and with, which will end by a real development and, and economic development in those countries. And this is what we need. So it is for the benefit all of us, for all of us to have and to reach uh, a settlement with Iran. What is going on in, in Yemen will definitely be reflected to mm. other countries. It, we will see uh, it in Iraq and we will see the consequences of what's happening there in Iraq and Syria and, and some other countries. Therefore, we have to have a settlement with uh, our neighbor, but this settlement has to be done through uh, a region talking to Iran, uh, a strategic plan to be taken with Iran, not just we talk today and we leave it for the other day for something else. Is what ha is happening in Yemen a direct result of U.S. disengagement in the region? Iran? Is what's happening in Yemen a direct result of U.S. disengagement in the region or this so-called Obama doctrine? No, I, I think what's happening in Yemen uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the United States is involved in it, but I would say that what's happening in, Ye in Yemen is going to be reflected on the other countries definitely. It will not end at Yemen. It will, we will be seeing the consequences on, on the other countries. So no ground forces in Yemen as of yet. Amr Musa, talk me through the strategy from your point of view in terms of what Egypt's role is going forward. Egypt role in Yemen. In Yemen. And in well, the region that, as well. that uh, brings to the discussion the situation in Yemen and what is happening in Yemen and the policies that have promoted uh, this uh, chaos in Yemen, uh, threatening the security of uh, Saudi Arabia, and in fact uh, uh, showing that there is something new in the region 
that is going to sow havoc, more havoc in the region. That's what prompted the Arabs in general to sit and think what's going on. We have been, as the collective Arab uh, uh, body, that uh, the Arabs are weak. We can do anything to them now. If, they, if you want to change the situation in Yemen, you do it. In Iraq, in Syria, etc., you do it. And perhaps other countries were, and still, on this list. So the decision is not a question of wars, but the decision of, the, of Saudi Arabia to invite Arab countries around, 11 countries, to support, support it in her firm step against what is happening in Yemen is a very serious strategic message that enough is enough. Some uh, went up by saying that we call the shots in four major capitals and in Baghdad, with all the history of Baghdad pertaining to us, the Arabs, or Damascus for that matter, or Beirut, or Sana'a. So to deal with us that way has triggered the reaction. And this was the first reaction, and I believe that it was right. The, I personally believe that what Saudi Arabia did is the right thing. And that Egypt supported Saudi Arabia is the right thing. Because we have to send back a message that, sorry, we cannot accept. Neither the, 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 what we see now as the beginning of new policy, new policies in the, in the region, that we are the majority in this region and we have to have a voice in its future. If I may just to build on that point, I mean, I agree that uh, the fact that an initiative was taken by Saudi Arabia with the other coalition members to do something about the situation in, uh, in Yemen and to, um, uh, to go intervene um, um, on the side of the legitimate uh, government is a case in point to prove that, again, we're changing from an old regional order to a new one where the region takes the lead. Uh, in, in its own issues and its own uh, effort. But it's not the first time, and that's where maybe I depart from, um, or perhaps you'll agree with me if I, once I finish saying it. Uh, it's not the first time. I think the fact uh, that we in the region have taken uh, the lead in the fight against terrorism and extremism also by saying, as we do in Jordan, that this is our fight. This is an Arab-Muslim fight, not an international fight, not a crusade. We had the same, uh, we had the same um, uh, situation back in uh, 2001 in Afghanistan, where people here in Jordan, the debate was, why are we going to fight uh, America's war in Afghanistan? We were not fighting America's war in, uh, in Afghanistan. We were fight, fighting, to, uh, fighting those who were distorting the image of, uh, of our religion and who were about to knock on our door. And they did in 2005 here in the hotel bombings in, uh, in, in Jordan. Uh, so again, the situation uh, is very similar now, where if you, um, um, uh, look at the, at the fact. This is a fight within Islam. This is a fight that has to be led by Muslims, uh, so that we can um, 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 again stop this distortion of the of the religion and fight um, warped ideology with a more convincing one. <coughs> Give me a sense then of where we are in that fight. Well, I, I definitely recognize a stronger Arab collective assertiveness as has just been described by Amr Musa and, and uh, Nasser Yuda. Uh, and, and that's maybe it's not new, but it's more visible now that, uh, than in a long time. That's an interesting observation. Uh, and I think the reasons were, were given just now. I still would like to point out that this geopolitical competition between key players, plus the chaos in, in, uh, in, in states that broke down or are breaking down, um, of course, it's a tragedy in itself because we have hundreds of thousands of lives lost in Syria and, and elsewhere. We have millions of refugees in this country only. I think there's one and a half million refugees from Syria and it's on top of the Palestinians who are already here. It's actually incredible that the country is doing as well as it does given all these challenges around. But one of the tragedies, of course, is that takes away energy and attention and political clout to deal with what is really the long-term challenges which is economic reform, political reform, give, give the young people a hope. Uh, you know, this is not to say that the security measures aren't necessary, because they are. But there's, it's extremely important to understand that some of this is tactical response to a long-term challenge. And the region needs to come more to ease with itself in order to be able to start what is urgently necessary, because there's, there's hundreds of millions of people who are striving for a better life. 
and it's possible. There's, there's resources, there are educated people, there's potential, it's close to important markets, but that is not really happening because <coughs> this, this uh, fight and this, this uh, geopolitical competition that we're seeing here. So I just wanted to say that that's also a security argument because security is not only about guns and bombs, it's also about providing stability that people believe in the long run. So what's the test case going to be? Are we talking, we're going to try this in Egypt, we're going to try this in uh, Jordan. Um, who's going to be the best test case? Because we were in Sharm el-Sheikh earlier this year, we were talking to everyone on the ground there about investing in Egypt and the future of Egypt and how important it was uh, that the economy get on the right track so that that state be it becomes a very secure state. Um, how are we going to get that process started? Is it started in that country or was this just a lot of hype? Arusa? I didn't get the last uh, portion of your question. Has, have we gotten started yet in terms of the process to making this a secure state and as a result of that you have a very strong economy in Egypt? Now, Egypt is now changing and uh, doing a lot to rebuild its economy and rebuild the country itself after uh, not only four years of chaos but in fact after many decades of bad governance. It is a real challenge to rebuild a country like Egypt. We will be 100 million inhabitants within four years, by 2010. We have to, to no, 2000 and, sorry, 20, 2020. So the challenge is immense. But the, the motto should be, we have got to be serious. We cannot build the economy on just donations or help coming from abroad, but through policies to use all the, to, to make use of the, all the, 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 the potentials we have. Uh, and we are optimistic about that. And the first step should be the elections. The president today said in his speech that the elections are going to, is the first step that he is going and his government is going to organize. So we are uh, uh, on the optimistic side. We know how serious the task is, but we know that Egypt has a double task to rebuild its uh, economy and its society and join its fellow Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries, African countries, Mediterranean countries in the change that is taking place. And I was pleased when I listened to the inaugural speech of President Sisi when he referred to Egypt as an Arab country, an African country, and a Mediterranean country. And this is a new opening, new approach that we know the, the interaction with Europe, with the Mediterranean, is so important in the economic and security uh, relations. But the first is we are an Arab country and we will remain so. So some serious uh, changes in the region, some major realignments of these countries. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for participating in the CNBC debate and we'll have to leave it there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.